I had been a park ranger for nearly two decades, but nothing could have prepared me for the terror I experienced in Silver Pine Forest, an isolated patch of dense woods nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains. It was a place of strange tales and whispered legends about cryptids, wandering spirits, and things better left unseen. Most rangers dismissed the stories as backwoods superstition, like, but the locals knew better. They avoided the area, leaving it mostly unexplored, a forbidden zone that nature had taken back. I wasn't a man who believed in the supernatural. My job was rooted in logic, patrolling the land and ensuring the safety of hikers and wildlife. But after what happened, I became a believer in forces beyond reason. It started on a crisp autumn evening. The sun was setting, casting an eerie glow over the orange and red foliage. I was stationed at Silver Pine for a two-week rotation, one of the few rangers willing to venture that deep into the forest. That evening, a call came through on the radio. A camper was missing, a young woman named Elise who had been backpacking with a friend. Her friend reported that Elise had wandered off into the woods to gather firewood and never returned. Search efforts had been underway for hours with no luck. I headed out to join the search party, driving my ATV into the forest as darkness fell. The forest was unnervingly quiet, no crickets chirping, no rustle of leaves, just silence, as though even nature was afraid to make a sound. As I ventured deeper, I noticed the trees growing denser and taller, their branches twisting in strange, unnatural ways. The deeper I went, the more I felt watched, as though the forest itself was alive and aware of my presence. My flashlight flickered occasionally, and my radio buzzed with static, the voice of the search team becoming distant and garbled. I pressed on, determined to find Elise. About three miles into the woods, I found something strange, a clearing I hadn't seen before where the trees seemed to form a perfect circle around a small pond. The water was so still it reflected the trees and sky like a mirror, yet something about it felt off. As I stood there, my radio crackled again, and through the static, I heard a voice, a woman's voice, faint but unmistakable, whispering my name. I froze. It wasn't possible. I hadn't told anyone my location, and no one was supposed to be this far out. The voice called again, this time clearer. Help me. Elise? I called my voice echoing through the silent woods. There was no response, but the air grew colder and the hairs on my neck stood on end. I took a step toward the pond, and that's when I saw it, movement in the water. A pale hand broke the surface, followed by another. Slowly, a figure emerged from the pond, soaked, shivering, but unmistakably human. It was Elise. Her hair clung to her face, and her skin was an unnatural, deathly white, but it was her. Relief washed over me, and I rushed toward her. Elise. We've been looking for you. I stopped dead in my tracks. Something was wrong. As she stood there, I noticed her eyes. They were vacant, clouded, as if she were in a trance. And then her lips parted and she whispered, run. Before I could react, something large moved in the trees behind her. Something massive, its silhouette blending into the shadows. It moved unnaturally, like a predator stalking its prey, but, but I couldn't make out its full shape. I could only see its eyes, gleaming red and watching me. I took a step back, my mind racing. I needed to get out of there, but my legs felt like lead. Elise, or whatever had taken her place, began to walk toward me. That's her eyes locked on mine, but her voice wasn't her own. It was deeper, twisted, as though something was speaking through her. It's coming, she said. It wants you. Suddenly, the trees erupted in motion, and the creature lunged out of the shadows. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. A massive, hulking form covered in matted fur, with elongated limbs and claws that scraped against the ground as it moved. Its face was a grotesque mix of animal and human features, its mouth filled with rows of sharp teeth. I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my chest. I could hear it crashing through the trees behind me, moving faster than any natural creature should. I didn't stop to look back. I couldn't. Every fiber of my being screamed that if I looked back, it would be the last thing I ever did. Branches whipped at my face and my legs burned as I pushed myself to the limit, sprinting blindly through the forest. The creature's footsteps were getting closer and with each second, I could feel its presence looming over me, a darkness that swallowed everything in its path. Just when I thought it would catch me, I burst out of the trees and onto the dirt road where I had left my ATV. I leapt onto the vehicle and gunned the engine, not daring to look back as I sped down the trail. The creature let out a guttural, ear-piercing scream, 
an unnatural sound that echoed through the forest and rattled my bones. I didn't stop until I reached the ranger station, where the rest of the search team had regrouped. I told them what I had seen, but no one believed me. Elisa's body was never found, and the search was called off days later. Officially, she was declared lost to the wilderness, but I knew the truth. Whatever lurks in Silver Pine Forest, it isn't human. And it's still out there, waiting. Story number two. Eerie, echoing footsteps. A cold wind blows through the trees. My name is Officer Dan, and I've been a park ranger in Redwood National Park for over 15 years. In that time, I've dealt with poachers, lost hikers, and even the occasional bear encounter. But nothing, nothing prepared me for the events of October 21st, 2017. It started as a normal shift. The sun was just beginning to set, casting long shadows over the dense forest. I was stationed at one of the more remote parts of the park, near an area the locals called The Hollow. It wasn't on any of the official maps, and most of the rangers knew to stay away from it. There were rumors, strange ones, about people going missing, ghost sightings, things like that. We all dismissed it as campfire stories to scare the tourists. That night, I was assigned to patrol near the hollow. I figured I'd get in, do a quick sweep, and head back to the station before it got too dark. But as soon as I entered that part of the forest, something felt off. The air was heavy, thick with an unnatural stillness. No wind, no rustling leaves, just an oppressive quiet. It's the kind of silence that makes you hyper-aware of your surroundings. Every twig snap or distant rustle seemed amplified, like the forest itself was holding its breath. I drove my jeep along the narrow dirt path that wound deeper into the hollow. The deeper I went, the darker it became, even though the sun hadn't fully set yet. The trees grew taller, thicker, their branches intertwining above like a twisted canopy. It was like the light itself was being swallowed by the forest. I stopped the jeep and decided to walk the rest of the way. Something about driving felt wrong. I grabbed my flashlight, radio, and map and stepped out into the dimming light. The air was colder than it should have been for that time of year. I could see my breath misting in front of me as I started walking. The path narrowed quickly, forcing me to maneuver between the towering trees. My flashlight beam cut through the darkness, illuminating patches of moss-covered ground and the occasional gnarled root. After about 20 minutes of walking, I started hearing it. Footsteps. At first, they were faint, barely audible, as if someone was following me at a distance. But every time I stopped and turned around, the noise would cease. I told myself it was just an animal, maybe a deer or a raccoon. But as I pressed on, the footsteps grew louder, closer, and more deliberate. They weren't the scurrying steps of a small creature. These were heavy, human-like footsteps, keeping pace with mine. I gripped my flashlight tighter, scanning the trees behind me. Nothing. Just empty forest. But the feeling of being watched wouldn't go away. My radio crackled to life, startling me. It was just static, but the interruption broke the tension for a moment. Dan, you okay out there? The voice of my colleague Randy came through, distorted by the static. I raised the radio to my mouth. Yeah, just doing a sweep. Quiet. Too quiet. Randy replied. You near the hollow? I hesitated. Yeah. Why? Be careful. Something's off with that place. Locals say it's cursed. I laughed, trying to shake off the growing unease. Yeah. I'll keep an eye out for ghosts. Don't joke, man. People vanish out there. Just stay sharp. I clicked the radio off and kept walking, but Randy's warning stuck with me. Vanish? The footsteps had stopped, but the feeling of being watched had only grown stronger. I couldn't shake the sensation that there were eyes on me from all directions, hidden among the trees. As I reached a small clearing, I noticed something strange. An old, dilapidated cabin, half hidden by the underbrush. It wasn't on any of the maps, and I had never seen it before. Curious, I approached it cautiously. The door was barely hanging on its hinges, creaking as it swayed in the light breeze. I shone my flashlight through the open doorway revealing a dark, empty interior. The walls were lined with crude carvings, symbols I didn't recognize. The floor was littered with broken furniture and old, rusted tools. But what caught my eye was a table in the center of the room. On it was a single, tattered journal. I picked it up, flipping through its brittle pages. The handwriting was shaky, frantic, like the author had been writing in a state of panic. Most of it was incoherent rambling about the watcher and the eyes in the trees. But one passage stuck out. 
They come at night, just after the sun dips below the horizon. You can hear them. You can feel them. Watching. Waiting. You can't run. You can't hide. They are always there. Always waiting. In the shadows. I snap the journal shut, a chill running down my spine. Suddenly, I heard it again. Those footsteps. Closer this time. Slow. Deliberate. Coming from just outside the cabin. My flashlight flickered. The beam weakening as the footsteps grew louder. My heart raced. I backed away from the door, my breath catching in my throat. The footsteps stopped. I was frozen, listening. Then, from just outside the window, I saw it. A figure standing in the darkness. It was tall, unnaturally tall. Its limbs too long, too thin. Its eyes, glowing white, stared directly at me through the window. I stumbled back, tripping over a chair as the thing moved closer, its face pressing against the glass. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, stretched tight over its skull. I could see its mouth moving, but no sound came out. It raised one long, bony finger and pointed directly at me. Without thinking, I bolted for the back door. I ran as fast as I could, not daring to look back. The footsteps chased me, matching my pace, but they weren't human. They were faster, heavier, pounding against the forest floor like thunder. I don't know how long I ran, but when I finally reached my jeep, I slammed the door shut and sped off, my heart racing, my mind spinning. As I drove away, I glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the figure chasing me down the road. But there was nothing, just the dark, empty forest. I never went back to the hollow. I put in a request for a transfer the next day. But sometimes, late at night, I still hear those footsteps, slow, deliberate, coming from just outside my window. I've stopped looking. Story number three. Ethan Parker had been a park ranger for over 10 years, patrolling the vast, untouched wilderness of Blackwater National Park. Spread across 200,000 acres, the park was home to towering evergreens, shadowy ravines, and ancient winding rivers. The deeper parts of the woods were off limits to the public, an area known simply as the Hollow. No one in town ever really talked about it, but everyone knew to stay away from those remote trails. Ethan had always been skeptical of the stories he'd heard, tales of creatures that roamed the forest under the cover of night. The locals called it the Watcher, a half-human, half-animal beast said to hunt anything that dared trespass in the heart of the forest. But Ethan chalked it up to folklore, just backwoods legends used to scare campers. That was until one October night. The night started like any other. Ethan was making his final patrol before heading back to the ranger station, cruising along the gravel trails in his beat-up jeep. The forest was eerily quiet, the only sound coming from the crunch of tires on dead leaves. A cold breeze drifted through the trees, carrying with it the scent of pine and decay. At 10.47 p.m., the radio on the dash crackled. It was dispatch. Ranger Parker, do you copy? He picked up the receiver. This is Parker. What's the situation? We've got a missing camper reported, a woman named Emily Drake. She was last seen around 2 p.m. near Lake Hollow Point. Could be lost. We need you to check the area. Ethan frowned. Lake Hollow Point was dangerously close to the hollow. Most people knew better than to go wandering that far out. Got it, I'll check it out, he said, and turned his jeep down the trail toward the lake. The deeper he drove, the darker the woods became. The trees grew denser, their twisted branches blotting out the moonlight. Even with the headlights on, it was hard to see more than a few feet ahead. A strange heaviness settled over the air, as if the forest were holding its breath. When Ethan reached the lake, he parked the jeep and grabbed his flashlight. The lake's surface was as smooth as glass, reflecting the skeletal trees along the shore. There was no sign of anyone, no footprints, no campsite, nothing. But just as he was about to turn back, something caught his eye. A trail of wet footprints led away from the water and into the forest. They were small, as if made by a barefoot woman, and they stopped abruptly at the edge of the tree line. He hesitated for a moment, his instincts telling him to leave. But his duty as a ranger pushed him forward. He followed the trail deeper into the woods, the beam of his flashlight cutting through the darkness. As Ethan moved farther from the lake, the air grew colder, and the forest seemed to close in around him. The trees whispered, their branches creaking like old bones. Every so often he thought he saw movement just beyond the edge of the light, a shadow darting between the trees, too quick to make out. Then the footprints stopped. In their place was something else. Claw marks, deep and jagged, carved into the dirt. The hair on the back of Ethan's neck stood up. 
These weren't the tracks of any animal he'd ever seen. The gouges were spaced too far apart, as if made by something that walked on two legs but wasn't human. Suddenly, a low growl echoed through the forest. It was deep, guttural, and unnatural. Ethan spun around, his flashlight shaking in his grip, but there was nothing there. Just trees and shadows. Then he saw it, a pair of glowing eyes staring at him from the darkness. Ethan's heart slammed in his chest as the creature stepped into the light. It stood nearly seven feet tall, with a gaunt, twisted body covered in matted fur. Its arms were too long, ending in sharp claws that gleamed in the moonlight. Its face was worse, a distorted blend of human and animal features with sharp teeth that jutted out from a gaping maw. This was the Watcher. Ethan stumbled backward, his mind racing. The stories were true, every single one of them. Before he could react, the creature let out an ear-piercing screech and lunged. Ethan barely had time to dive out of the way as its claws slashed the air where he just stood. He hit the ground hard, the flashlight flying from his hand and landing several feet away. He scrambled to his feet and ran. Branches tore at his clothes as he sprinted through the forest, the creature's growls following close behind. He could hear it crashing through the underbrush, its heavy footsteps thudding against the ground. No matter how fast he ran, it was gaining on him. Up ahead, he saw the faint glow of his jeep's headlights through the trees. Desperation fueled his legs as he burst through the undergrowth and threw himself into the driver's seat. Slamming the door shut, he jammed the key into the ignition and twisted. The engine sputtered but didn't start. No, 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 Ethan muttered, frantically turning the key again. The creature was almost on him, its glowing eyes locked on the jeep. With a roar, the engine roared to life. Ethan floored the gas pedal and the jeep lurched forward, tires spinning on the loose dirt. Just as the creature reached the rear bumper, the jeep shot down the trail. Ethan didn't stop driving until he reached the ranger station. He slammed the jeep into park and stumbled inside, his heart pounding. He grabbed the radio and called dispatch. This is Parker, he gasped. I need backup. There's something out there, a creature. Before he could finish, the radio cut out. All that remained was static. Then from outside the station came a familiar sound, a low growl deep and guttural. Ethan froze, slowly he turned toward the window, and there it was. The watcher stood just outside, its glowing eyes fixed on him. It raised one clawed hand and tapped once, twice on the glass, then it smiled. Story number four. I'd been a park ranger in the Pacific Northwest for nearly 12 years. And during that time, I had encountered my share of strange, strange happenings in the dense, misty forests of Blackwood Pines. But nothing could compare to what happened during my last patrol, a night I'll never forget. The locals had always warned of strange things in the deeper woods, and some of the older rangers shared eerie, eerie tales of encounters with something they couldn't quite explain. But I brushed them off as folklore, until the night I came face to face with the unknown. It was a late October evening, and I had just been assigned the night shift for the first time in months. There was something unsettling about patrolling Blackwood Pines at night. The towering trees, thick with moss and undergrowth, seemed to close in on you, and the fog rolled in so thick that it was almost like the forest was swallowing everything whole. But the worst part was the silence, an unnatural stillness where even the wildlife seemed to vanish. I was on my usual route, checking the perimeter near the old logging trails that hadn't been used in decades. The deeper I drove, the thicker the fog became, and soon the world outside my headlights was just a blur of gray. I slowed the truck to a crawl, my eyes darting to the trees as shadows seemed to flicker at the edge of my vision. As I reached a section of the forest known as Raven's Hollow, my radio crackled to life. It was George, another ranger stationed a few miles north. Hey, you out there? His voice was distorted with static. Yeah, just driving through Raven's Hollow. What's up? I responded, feeling a bit of relief at the sound of another voice. I got a weird report from one of the hikers earlier, George said. They said they saw something moving through the trees, something big, thought it might be a bear, but they swore it wasn't. My grip tightened on the wheel. Bears were common in the area, but there was an edge to George's voice that unnerved me. Did they describe it? Not really, just said it felt wrong, like it wasn't supposed to be there. I scoffed, trying to brush off the growing tension. Probably just their imagination. Maybe, George replied. Just be careful out there. The woods feel off tonight. 
With that, the radio cut off, leaving me alone in the thickening fog. I continued driving, trying to shake off the unease creeping up my spine. But something didn't sit right. The forest felt too quiet, too still. A sudden movement ahead made me slam on the brakes. My headlights illuminated something crossing the road, a large hulking figure moving quickly into the trees. My heart raced as I stared into the darkness, the fog swirling around the beam of my lights. It had been too fast to make out clearly, but I was certain it wasn't a bear. Grabbing my flashlight and rifle, I stepped out of the truck and walked cautiously toward the spot where I'd seen the figure. The air was heavy, thick with moisture, and, and the ground beneath my boots felt softer than usual. As I approached the tree line, I noticed something strange. The trees were covered in deep claw marks, as though something massive had torn through them. But the spacing was too wide, too unnatural for any known animal. My flashlight flickered, casting long shadows against the trees. The silence was suffocating now, and the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. I swept the beam of light across the undergrowth, my breath fogging in the cool night air. That's when I saw it. At the edge of the light, a pair of eyes, large, glowing, a dull yellow, watched me from the darkness. They blinked slowly, unblinking, as if studying me. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature was tall, unnaturally so, its shadowy form blending into the trees. It stood on two legs, but its posture was hunched, its limbs long and gaunt. I backed up slowly, my hand gripping the rifle tightly. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't something I had ever seen before. Its eyes followed my every move, glowing eerily in the beam of my flashlight. And then, without warning, it let out a low, guttural growl, a sound so deep and primal that it seemed to vibrate through the air. My instincts kicked in, and I turned and bolted back to the truck, my pulse racing. I fumbled with the keys as I jumped inside, slamming the door shut and locking it. I hit the gas and tore down the narrow road, the creature's growl echoing through the trees behind me. The fog was thicker than ever, but I didn't care. I just needed to get out. My headlights illuminated the winding path ahead, and for a moment I thought I was safe. But then, as I rounded a sharp bend, something slammed into the side of the truck. The force of the impact sent me skidding off the road and into a ditch. My head slammed against the steering wheel, and everything went black. When I came to, the truck's engine had stalled, and the fog outside was even denser than before. I could hear something moving outside, circling the vehicle. Heavy, deliberate footsteps crunched through the fallen leaves. I held my breath, gripping the rifle, but my hands were shaking. The creature's shadow loomed in the mist, moving closer. I could feel its presence, a dark, oppressive weight pressing in on me from all sides. The truck rocked slightly as something brushed against it and the low growl rumbled through the air again. I didn't wait. I threw the door open, scrambled out, and ran. I didn't care where I was going, just away from that thing. The fog swallowed me and the trees seemed to twist and stretch in impossible ways as I stumbled through the woods, my breath coming in ragged gasps. Finally. After what felt like hours, I broke through the tree line and found myself back at the ranger station. I burst inside, slamming the door behind me. George was there, staring at me with wide eyes. What the hell happened to you? I couldn't find the words. All I could do was collapse into a chair, my mind reeling from the encounter. I never went back to Blackwood Pines after that night. I left the job, unable to shake the feeling that whatever was out there lurking in the misty woods was still watching, waiting. Story number five. My name is Mike Lanson, a park ranger stationed at Blackwood National Forest, a place known for its sprawling woods, serene lakes, and miles of hiking trails. I've worked there for over a decade, guiding visitors, rescuing lost campers, and making sure the wilderness stays protected. But there's one trail we don't talk about, the old logging road deep in the forest known as the Phantom Trail. No maps show it anymore, and we've made sure the signs pointing toward it are long gone. But sometimes, even without the signs, people find it, and that's when things go wrong. It was mid-September, right before dusk, when I got the call. A hiker, a man in his 30s, hadn't returned from his hike. His wife reported him missing after he was a few hours overdue. She mentioned that her husband had been fascinated by old trails and hidden paths, the kinds that don't show up in guidebooks. Immediately, my mind went to the phantom trail. I tried to brush it off, but the thought stuck like a thorn. I grabbed my gear, a flashlight, my radio, a map of the forest, and my trusty rifle, just in case. 
I set out toward the direction his wife said they'd been hiking. As I walked deeper into the woods, the sky began to darken, the trees casting long shadows that seemed to stretch endlessly into the underbrush. About an hour in, I found something odd, a branch sticking out from the side of the trail, placed almost deliberately to point in a direction off the beaten path. I hesitated, but my gut told me this was the sign. I stepped off the main trail, pushing through the dense undergrowth, the familiar sounds of the forest beginning to fade. As I pressed further, the forest around me seemed to change. The trees grew gnarled and twisted, their branches forming strange, claw-like shapes against the darkening sky. The air grew colder, and the forest, which should have been filled with the sounds of crickets and owls at this time of night, was dead silent. It was like stepping into another world entirely. Eventually, I stumbled upon it. The Phantom Trail. It looked exactly as I remembered from the last time I dared come here, years ago. The path was narrow, overgrown, and lined with old, crumbling stone markers that had been long forgotten. The trees along the path were blackened, their bark charred as if from a fire, though no fires had ever been reported in this area. I continued down the trail, the oppressive silence weighing on me like a heavy blanket. The sun had nearly set, and the dim light barely penetrated the thick canopy overhead. I clicked on my flashlight, its weak beam struggling to cut through the creeping darkness. That's when I saw him, a man standing a little ways ahead on the trail, his back to me. I called out, Hey, are you the hiker? Your wife's looking for you. But he didn't move. He just stood there, perfectly still, staring into the woods. Something about his posture was off. It was rigid, unnatural. I felt a chill crawl up my spine. I stepped closer, shining my flashlight on him. Sir, are you all right? He still didn't respond. I took another step, and that's when I realized he wasn't standing on the ground. His feet weren't touching the dirt. He was floating. My heart stopped. I backed up instinctively, the beam of my flashlight shaking in my hand. The man slowly turned his head to face me, and I swear to God I'll never forget that face for as long as I live. His eyes were wide, impossibly wide, and his mouth was stretched into an unnatural grin. His skin was pale, almost translucent, and his eyes, they didn't look human. He spoke, but his voice wasn't right. It was layered, like multiple voices speaking at once. You shouldn't be here. I stumbled back, my breath caught in my throat. My mind screamed at me to run, but my legs wouldn't move. I was rooted to the spot, frozen by the sheer wrongness of the figure in front of me. He lifted a hand, thin, skeletal fingers pointing at me, and suddenly, the forest came alive with sound. Not the normal sounds of the woods, but something else. I heard voices, whispers, coming from all directions. They were close, but I couldn't see anyone. It was like the trees themselves were whispering, their branches creaking and groaning with the weight of something unseen. Then, from the corner of my eye, I saw movement. Dark figures slipping between the trees, darting in and out of the shadows. They were quick, too quick to get a good look at, but I knew they weren't animals. They were something else. Something watching me, surrounding me. I snapped out of my trance and did the only thing I could do. I ran. I tore back down the trail, the whispers growing louder, the dark figures following me, their shapes flitting in and out of the trees like living shadows. The air grew colder, the darkness thicker, and my flashlight began to flicker. The beam growing weaker with every step. I didn't stop. I didn't dare look back. The trail was disorienting, twisting and turning, and I felt like I was running in circles. But eventually, I broke through the tree line, back onto the main path. The whispers stopped, the cold vanished, and when I turned around, the phantom trail was gone. Just gone, like it had never existed in the first place. I radioed for backup, and they sent out a search team. We scoured the area for hours, but we never found that hiker or the trail. He had vanished, just like the others. I don't go near that part of the woods anymore. None of us do. The phantom trail comes and goes as it pleases, and those who wander too far down it are never seen again. But sometimes, on quiet nights, when the wind is just right, I still hear the whispers, and I know the forest is watching. Story number six. Nathan Harper was one of the most experienced park rangers in the country. He'd served in many remote areas, but none felt as isolating as Raven Hill National Forest. Nestled miles away from civilization, the forest was notorious for strange disappearances. Locals believed something lived deep within, something ancient and malevolent. They called it the Skinwalker, though no one dared to speak about it openly. 
When Nathan's co-worker, Ranger Lewis, failed to report back from his night patrol, Nathan was sent to investigate. Lewis had last radioed from an area near Hollow Creek, a place known for its impenetrable darkness, even during the day. People avoided it, but as a ranger, duty came first. At dusk, Nathan packed his gear, grabbed his rifle, and set off alone. The forest was unusually silent as he trekked through the dense woods. No birds, no rustling leaves, just an oppressive, dead silence. Nathan's boots crunched against the undergrowth, and every step felt heavier, as if the forest didn't want him there. By the time he reached Hollow Creek, the sky was pitch black. He swept the area with his flashlight, the beam illuminating only tangled branches and thick mist rolling off the water. Lewis, Nathan called, his voice echoing through the emptiness. No response. Then, just as he was about to turn back, something caught his eye. A torn piece of fabric dangled from a tree branch, a fragment of Lewis's uniform. Nathan's stomach tightened as he approached the tree and found deep claw marks carved into the bark. Lewis hadn't gone missing by accident. Something had taken him. Nathan followed a trail of disturbed earth and broken branches leading deeper into the woods. His flashlight flickered, and for a brief second, he thought he saw movement ahead. Something large, walking upright. But it vanished into the trees before he could get a good look. The trail ended abruptly at a shallow clearing. In the center lay a mangled, bloodied ranger hat. Nathan knelt beside it, his heart racing. This was Lewis's. Suddenly, a strange sound broke the silence, a low, guttural mimic of human speech. Nathan! Na-a-than! His blood turned cold. Whatever made that sound was no person. It was a grotesque mockery, like a predator practicing human language. Nathan slowly stood and aimed his flashlight toward the source of the voice. That's when he saw it. Something standing just beyond the edge of the clearing, half hidden in the shadows. It looked almost human. Almost. Its limbs were too long, its skin stretched unnaturally tight across its bones. Dark, sunken eyes gleamed back at him, and its jaw was slightly unhinged as if grinning. And it wore Lewis's face, or something pretending to be him. Nathan took a step back, his breath shallow and quick. The creature tilted its head, mimicking the gesture like a curious animal. Then it spoke again, but this time in Lewis's voice, perfectly imitated. Help me, Nathan. Please. The thing stepped into the clearing, revealing the rest of its body, gaunt and twisted, with patches of fur and claws too large for its hands. It was wearing pieces of Lewis's uniform, as if it had dressed itself in his skin and clothes. Nathan raised his rifle, hands trembling. What the hell are you? He whispered. The creature smiled wider, and its voice shifted, first Lewis's, then Nathan's own voice, spoken back to him in an eerie, mocking tone. What the hell are you? It took another step closer. Nathan fired. The shot rang out through the forest, the echo lingering in the still air. The bullet hit the creature square in the chest, but it didn't fall. Instead, it stumbled back, as if the impact was more of an annoyance than a wound. It straightened its spine, and Nathan swore it looked amused. Then it began to change. Its limbs cracked and twisted, lengthening unnaturally. Its skin rippled, as if something beneath it was shifting, struggling to break free. And then it ran. The creature moved so fast Nathan barely had time to react. He turned and sprinted through the woods, crashing through branches and underbrush, his flashlight bouncing wildly. The thing chased after him, its footsteps unnervingly quiet, as if it floated through the trees. Nathan's lungs burned and his legs screamed for rest, but he couldn't stop. He knew if he did, it would catch him, and there would be nothing left of him but a shell for the creature to wear. He spotted a ranger outpost up ahead, its windows glowing faintly in the dark. Fueled by desperation, Nathan burst through the door and slammed it shut behind him. He locked the door, breathing heavily, and slumped against the wall. For a moment, everything was still. Then came the tapping, soft, deliberate taps on the window. Nathan slowly turned his head. The creature was there, standing just outside, staring in at him. It raised one clawed hand and pressed it against the glass, and then it smiled. It didn't try to break in. It didn't need to. The message was clear. It knew where he was, and it was only a matter of time. Nathan backed away from the window, trembling. He grabbed the radio from the desk and tried to call for help, but all he got was static. The creature stood perfectly still, watching him with those empty, sunken eyes. Then it whispered through the glass in Lewis's voice, You'll be next, Nathan. Nathan sat down in the corner of the outpost, rifle in hand, and waited. 
Hours passed, but the creature never moved from the window. It stood there, patient, as if it enjoyed watching him squirm. The first rays of sunlight finally crept over the treetops. When the light hit the window, the creature gave one last smile and slinked back into the woods, vanishing into the shadows. Nathan knew it wasn't gone. Not really. It would be waiting for him, deep in the woods, where no one would hear him scream.